Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here in the Lord's presence. Uh, let's <coughs> praise the Lord today and let's uh, ask for his blessings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us be here today in your house with each other. Father, we know that's such a privilege to get encouragement and be encouraged by other believers, Father. We thank you that we can come here and seek your face, Father. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our forgiveness of sins, Father. We thank you that we can ask directly to you, Father, that your blessings will flow to us. Father, give us, uh, let us give you the praise and honor and glory that you deserve, Father through our singing, through our raising of our voices. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So good to be together in the house of the Lord. Um, stand, please, as we sing our first praise song as we lift our voices to the Lord. <laughs> Surprise! 
kind of confused here because I, I usually don't get to stand up quite this early in the service, you know, but I'm blessed with the opportunity to share with you uh, in, in this matter of the Lord's Supper. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about offering as well. Um, I received a, a devotion this morning from Dave. Most mornings, or all mornings, I receive a devotion from Dave. And uh, 
this morning's devotion, and, and especially the song that he accompanied with it from Keith Green, just spectacular. The idea that, that God uses people who are fully committed to him. And of course, there are some notable exceptions. Jonah was mentioned. Yes, yeah, all right. Uh, but Jonah was fully committed to his vision of what life was supposed to be, including his. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do, so he went the other way. We know how that turned out. Then there's this guy named Saul of Tarsus. He was an exception as well. Now, he was fully committed to his religion. But he didn't understand that God was doing a new thing. That's right. Jesus was fully committed to doing what God would have him do. And what Jesus would do would be an incredible, incredible blessing for us. He would go to the cross. But there are some interesting moments leading up to that. And uh, I'll be in Matthew 26, uh, starting with 36. If you want to follow along, you certainly can. Matthew 26, starting with 36, a very familiar passage. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. You think Jesus would have been pretty excited about this, you know? He's getting to do what God wants him. Well, it would come with pain. It would come with the ending of his life here on this earth. As a fully human and yet fully God individual, I have no idea how I would respond, I, at least as the type of things that Jesus is saying here. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So, was Jesus fully committed to doing God's will? Absolutely. Could we say that he wavered for a moment there? No, I wouldn't say that. You can say what you want. But I can't help but see that Jesus came to this moment at some place around 33 years old. We don't know his exact age at that time. In the prime of life to surrender himself for you and me. And as we come to this communion, we celebrate. And it's not like party, yeah. It's more like, wow, he did that for me. And he did that for you so that we could have the blessing of our sins being washed away and the hope and promise of heaven. That's why we receive this representation of his body and his blood because of all that he did to accomplish God's will and purpose for us. Thank you, Father, for being with us as we ponder over what Jesus did and think about uh, the, the surrender of his body as we hold this bread in our hands. We think about the shedding of his blood. Father, thank you for what you sent him to do and that he fulfilled what you had him to do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, for those of you who might be newer with us or uncertain, uh, we don't pass the plates. Uh, of course, we receive an offering, but we don't pass the plates. Uh, there's a little box back there next to Cameron, 
and one by the door there. Behind me, I'm sure it says that you can go to our church website and find the place that it says give or donate or uh, what, whatever it says uh, on that site. And you can make a contribution that way. And they are greatly appreciated and needed. You may notice that the air conditioning is working better this week than it did last week. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Well, that meant having somebody come and do what it was required to fix the air conditioning. We'll talk more about uh, expense types at, a, at another time, I suppose. But I want to tell you a story. As the story goes, a pig and a chicken went for a walk one morning. And as they were walking, the chicken said, hey, why don't we have breakfast? And the pig said, what do you want to have? And the chicken said, how about ham and eggs? And the pig said, for you, that's a contribution. For me, it's a commitment. I struck some funny bones down front here. I like this. Thanks, guys. That, yeah. Oh, that's right. That, he said that too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, somehow they, they must have had a translator, you know, to yeah. tell what each one said. So when we look ourselves in the mirror, do we make a commitment to God or a contribution? Now, contributions are very nice. Commitment means that our time, our talent, and our treasure belong to God. That doesn't mean we put everything of our time, everything of our talent, and everything of our treasure in that offering box or send it online. It means that our desire is to see God's kingdom grow. And the way that we help God's kingdom grow is by trusting him, obeying him, expressing our love to him. And so when we look at our financial resources, and if we say, God, I'm going to make more than a contribution. I'm making a commitment to you. I think that grows us and challenges us. And so we always want to do the right thing and the best thing to grow ourselves as well as to grow God's kingdom. Now, I'm going to be very careful, and I'm not going to say, make sure you be like the pig, because that might not be a good thing. But don't be chicken, either. If we all together do what's right before God, he continues to build his kingdom through us. Father, thank you for all who give of their hearts and their lives to you. Thank you for the opportunity to share the resources that you've entrusted to us in time, talent, and treasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, kids, go ahead to uh, Children's Church. Uh, just a couple of announcements. And I said last week, I always forget one. I forgot to announce that Tuesday night was our leadership meeting. And that was the closest thing to us schedule-wise. Uh, men's breakfast is this coming Saturday, July 22nd, 8 o'clock at Mom and Pops. Uh, next Sunday, uh, Stephanie Costa will be here from Albania. And Stephanie is actually from Georgia, but she's married to a man uh, who is Albanian. And uh, there are some pictures posted on the back there uh, from my trip. Uh, and one is of the family, uh, Arianne and Stephanie and David and Abby. And uh, I enjoyed my, my stay in Albania so much and working with Arianne and Stephanie. And uh, they have a great, great heart for the, the people there and a heart for the Lord. And I know you're going to enjoy being here and hearing Stephanie next week. She's going to be speaking during Sunday school uh, and then here in, in the worship time as well. And so I encourage you, if you don't usually come at uh, 9.30 for Sunday school, come on out and uh, we'll, we'll have a sharing time next week as well. Um, August 11th and 12th, I guess the 13th too, 
uh, a preacher who's now retired named Bob Russell is going to be over in uh, Portsmouth at the West Park Church. And uh, if you have the opportunity that Friday evening or Saturday morning especially to come and hear Bob, he's a great speaker and all, he's, he's a great analyst of churches and church growth. So um, uh, let one of the elders or myself know and we'll get you more information if you're interested in, in uh, those meetings. Ought to be a good time. Uh, what else? What did I forget to announce here today? Oh, ladies' Bible study is the same day as the uh, Bob Russell thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's that's still a man. Thank you. Let me write that down. Church work day. Yes, the 29th, eight o'clock or whatever time you can get here. Um, Sharon and I are going to be gone that week. But I've already started doing some of the things that need to be done for that week. Uh, if you can't be here that Saturday morning, I understand. I hope everybody does. But if you can do something uh, an evening leading up to that, um, see one of the elders and uh, they can share the punch list with you and uh, see what you'd like to do, what you're able to do. Some of it is, is cleaning. Uh, the carpet in here. The floor in here picks up a lot of little pieces of stuff. And if somebody wants to run the vacuum cleaner, the offices need clean. Oh boy, especially right now. Um, well, we've had water leaks back in. I don't want to share that. Good. Thank you very much. The the work day. Yeah. Uh, if you have a prayer list and you want to pull it out, uh, pray for Susan M. Susan Monglikmod is her name. Uh, uh, she's a woman in her. Well, I don't want to say her age because it gets recorded, but uh, she's younger than I am. Isn't everybody, right? Uh, but Susan has kidney cancer. We'll be having surgery a week from tomorrow. Uh, so please keep Susan in your prayers. Prayer for Mike Shorter and his family. Seems like we had the same announcement last week, but Mike's dad had died, and now his mom has died. And so just within a matter of weeks from each other. Um, Mary has asked for prayers for her friend um, who is pregnant with preeclampsia uh, as a complication. So please pray for that friend. Uh, pray for Kim with her, her heart situation. Uh, Yvonne asked for prayers for her friend Dave. Uh, I, I have a praise. My sister and brother-in-law who do mission work in Mexico were down there on a trip across the southern part of Mexico where they work and they were hit by a semi with a double trailer. And the semi didn't stop or slow down. Fortunately, it was only the rear quarter panel and back left tire that were damaged. Praise God. Just a matter of a couple feet. Well, anyways, I don't want to think of those terms. Uh, Dave has asked for prayer for his great nephew, Michael, starting with Job Corps. Uh, praise the Lord, Jennifer Livingston, starting a full-time job at the shipyard. Definitely. Yvonne, prayers for Jared, fiance of her daughter, being deployed. So just, uh, and, and keep Yvonne's daughter in prayer as well. Uh, any other prayer needs or praises today? Yep. Yep. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to all of our workers. Um, I went in the back there and, and there were so many kids there today, you know, they had her lean down and, and she was fighting back, you know, and uh, no, no, she, she had some other adult help in there too. Praise God for that. But, uh, I, I have so much appreciation for all of our teachers, all of you who, uh, extend yourself to help and uh, praise God for all the kids. Uh, we have them coming in from the street now. So now they didn't stay long, but that's... <laughs> uh, you know, praise God for, for all of our workers, all those who serve the Lord. Use your time and your talents for him. Uh, other prayer concerns and praises. It's good to see Jimmy with us today. Jimmy's been on our prayer list recently. 
And uh, uh, Jim, what's what's it been? A couple months since you lost your mom? 105, okay, yeah. And uh, Jim's had some health problems, and but seeing God at work. So, Jim, glad you're here today. Uh, Dave, would you come up and pray for us? I, I, I say that at some risk, because I know Dave is having some issues as well with his, his heart and his health. Father, we just want to praise your name. We thank you so much for how you've blessed us. Lord, you look down on us and you love us in spite of us. And we cannot comprehend why. And so we thank you. Father, you've heard our petitions. They mean so much to each and every one of us. We have loved ones who are hurting, who are deployed. We've lost loved ones. Father, the pain goes on. And only you can remove it. And so we place each and every issue at your feet. We ask for the best solution in each case. We know, Lord, that that's what all you want is what's best for each of us. And so that's what we ask for. And sometimes what we ask for is, is not feasible. And so what we ask for today is what's proper, what's right what's best in each case. We praise you, Father, for those answers. We thank you for taking the time to listen and to know what we need and to provide it. And we praise you, Father, for allowing us to bring you all of our petitions as well as our praises. We ask your blessing today, Father, on our activities here. May the words that are spoken touch each and every heart that hears them. May each of us need the nuggets from the word that we need to hear. Take it to heart and allow it to draw us closer to you. And we thank you, Father, for the living word, your son, Jesus. who came to earth and walked among us, but then saw how much we needed him to go back to you. And so he sacrificed himself, Father, so that we could return to you also. And we praise you for that. And we thank you, Jesus, for doing that job for us. And it's through Jesus' most precious name we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. And uh, as I said, make sure you add Dave to your, your prayer list as well. Sometimes I'm not sure why. Okay. You decided to play after all. So here we are. It's the middle of summer, and we're talking about Deuteronomy. Isn't that exciting? Well, if you're like me, I don't always read Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, when you open your Bible, if you had to kind of peel some pages apart, I would understand. But when I look at Deuteronomy and, and the weeks that I'm preaching the rest of this summer, and there are a few coming up that I'm going to be gone uh, or, or we'll have a guest speaker. But 
we're going to cover some very important passages out of Deuteronomy. And if you're not familiar with it, we'll talk about it in, in just a couple minutes. But the reason for looking at Deuteronomy is because it, it gives us so much that launches us in the direction of the coming of Jesus. And we're going to look at how Deuteronomy is used in the New Testament. There are close to 40 references to Deuteronomy, many of them in the Gospel. And so we'll be looking at all these different passages and then look at, at some of the bigger passages in coming weeks or whatever. Uh, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of our Bible. It was written by Moses probably around 1450 B.C., we don't know exact dates for, for this kind of thing, but close enough to that. Uh, this is the end of Moses' life and the end of the 40 days of wandering in the wilderness. And that's huge. Years. Years. What did I say? 40 days. Oh. Well, you know, for us modern people, 40 days seems like forever. <laughs> I was just seeing if you were listening. Yes, 40 years, thank you. <laughs> That's what I get for my, my brain being working down over here while my mouth is talking over, over here. It happens. Uh, the, the word Deuteronomy means second law. Now, did they need a second law? Absolutely. Why did they need a second law? It's because, you know, 40 years before this, did I say that one right? 40 years? Good, good. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and a lot of the laws were established and, and whatever, uh, as they wandered in the wilderness coming up, they weren't intended to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, but they wouldn't listen to God and do what he said. And all of the people who were adults 40 years before and heard this are now dead or close to it. Because there are only a couple people, Caleb and Joshua, who are going to be going into the promised land after the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And they were two spies, the two of the 12 spies, that said, we need to get in there because they're so big we can't miss. And all the other people were saying, well, they're so big we're going to get crushed. And so Joshua and Caleb are going in, but everybody else has died in the wilderness. And Moses will die on the mountain. And then Israel will go in across the Jordan River under Joshua. And so before they go into the, the promised land, Moses gives some lectures, uh, some uh, narratives or whatever you want to call them, telling them about the commands, telling them about the law, telling them about what God has done. And so a lot of the stories, especially Exodus, uh, Leviticus and Numbers, and a lot of the, the teachings are going to be repeated so that they are reminded. This was also necessary because we as human beings are forgetful. We as human beings kind of ignore things or forget things that we don't want to be true or don't want to follow. And so it was important for them, for the new leaders, uh, to be reminded as well as the people. And so the second law is given. And they have the opportunity to hear once again what God has done. When we get to Deuteronomy chapter 5, we'll see that the Ten Commandments are there repeated. They needed to be reminded about that. In, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, we're going to see that, that uh, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord their God is one God. We'll have uh, Mike Rossi dancing in the aisle when we get to that, that passage. <laughs> He's dancing now, but anyways, fortunately, I'm the only one who had to see that, me and Kim. Um, anyways, let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 1. Take a look at verses 5 through 8. And uh, this kind of sets the, the stage, sets the tone, if you will. Uh, Deuteronomy 1, 5 through 8. East of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples of the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. 
See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give uh, the land. He swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Now, if we're making a movie, we picture the guy with that, that clapper thing. I don't even know what that's called. Standing in front of Moses going, take one. And then Moses gives this speech. God gave this land to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now get up and go. We don't want to go. We're afraid to go. We're afraid that we might not be able to come back here and stay afterwards. Oh, if we go in there, maybe there's not very much food. Maybe there's not much water. Oh, these guys are so big. 40 years later, take two. Except now the people have been very uncomfortable for 40 years living in wilderness. They, they've, they've really lacked purpose and direction because they're not following God. And little by little, some of them begin to follow God and do what he says. And so now they are going to go in. But they need to be told that this is what God wants them to do. Let's go a little bit farther down in this passage. Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 33. But you were unwilling to go up. Deuteronomy 1, 26 says, you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going uh, before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his child all the way until you went uh, all the way you went until you reached this place in spite of this you did not trust the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show the way that you should go Moses says, hey, folks, God's been with you through it all. He's willing to lead you in. He's willing to win the battles for you. You saw how he brought you out of Egypt. And for the younger ones, they heard the stories of it. They knew that God is an awesome God. What this says to me for today is that so many times we see God at work now, does that mean life is perfect? No. No, there are a lot of difficulties in this life. A lot of times we need the difficulties to point us to God, to be honest. There are too many people who have such an easy life that they don't think they need God because they have such an easy life. I'm glad none of us suffer from that, right? But it's so important that we watch what God does, that we pay attention to what the scripture says because it shows us a lot, it teaches us a lot. Make sure that we watch the way that God answers our prayers. And sometimes we feel like God's not hearing our prayers. Maybe that just means the time isn't right. Or what we're asking for needs to be refined. But we need to grow before God answers that prayer. Whatever it is, when we learn to trust him, he's going to help us and he's going to win victories for us. And help us through to the other side. Well, let's make sure that we're trusting God to the best of our ability. We'll see the, those victories come. Well, how do we know that Deuteronomy was important to Jesus and to the early church? That, that's, one, that's part of my premise here today, is that this book was important to Jesus. We're going to look at, at uh, oh, three or four kind of main sections here out of the Gospels and, uh, and then look at, at some about the church. Uh, let's start with uh, Matthew, or excuse me, yeah, Matthew chapter 4. One of these days I'll learn to read my own handwriting or else write more legibly. Probably not. Matthew chapter 4 at the beginning is an interesting passage because Jesus has just been baptized. And he comes up out of the water. Of course, the, the Spirit has descended upon him as a dove. And you hear the voice of God. And he gets up and he goes into the wilderness. 
And when he goes into the wilderness, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Make sure I say that the right way. Maybe that's where my 40 days came from earlier. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. <laughs> Go figure, right? By the way, it's really important that it says 40 days and 40 nights. Because a lot of the religious leaders of Jesus' day fasted from sunup to sundown. And so if they ate a meal before the sun came up and then ate another one when the sun came down, their fast really was only missing one meal. Okay, that's something, right? But Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. The tempter came, verse 3 says, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Hey, hungry guy. Doesn't that look like bread? You know, pita, you know, flat, you know, flat stones. Uh, doesn't that look like bread? Oh, you say that you're the son of God. You got, you got lunch here, you know. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Oh, so Jesus has something more important than whether he's got food or not doing what God says. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. Because you know, Jesus, you know the Bible, but I know the Bible too. It is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus, do you believe that? Don't you trust God? Throw yourself down, come on. I believe this is in the 91st Psalm, by the way. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And the angels came and attended Jesus. So where's Deuteronomy in here? Well, only three places. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Yes, we're back to Israel then. To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, that bread stuff, that flaky stuff that would come down every night. They could scoop it up and fix it a hundred different ways and eat it, but it was all still manna. Which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Oh, there it is. So, when Jesus was a kid and he went to Sunday school, okay, Saturday school, maybe Friday night school, who knows? Well, the Sabbath starts at sundown on Friday. But. And when Jesus went to synagogue and the rabbi was teaching and the elders were reading scripture and Jesus was listening, Jesus learned, Jesus heard, Jesus took God's word inside of himself. And here he is faced with the most direct temptation any person would ever face. Here's the devil in his face. Hey, turn those stones into bread. You don't have to be hungry like this. Give in to your baser needs here. Nah, man doesn't live by bread alone. <laughs> but we're gonna to listen to God's word. Oh. Well, how about uh, another place? How about Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 16? Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you, for the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. 
Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. That last verse we saw in the temptation, didn't we? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The first verse that I read uh, about fear the Lord your God, serve him only. You know, that came into it too. Because when Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and I'm told that the area there was the corner of the temple, not the top of the temple itself necessarily, but the corner of the temple on one side was about 400 foot drop. And so the, the opportunity to put God to the test was there, right? Jesus said, no, he's gonna trust God. He's gonna do what God says to seek the Lord's will. So was Deuteronomy important to Jesus when he's facing the greatest temptation of his life three times, he goes back to Deuteronomy. It kind of tells us that maybe we should be looking at Deuteronomy a little bit more. We should be memorizing more scripture. And that's true wherever we go. And a lot of times, unless, well, when, when I was a kid, I did a lot of memory work and Sunday school contests. And I like to win. When I was uh, going into my senior year of high school, I think my dad was concerned that us four kids were kind of bored and he put a challenge in front of us to memorize scripture. And so that summer I memorized some scripture. And I can't tell you how many times over the years that I have needed God's wisdom and it comes out in the scriptures that I have already memorized. Isn't that something? feel like you're hearing God's voice. Now, did I always do what God wanted me to do, even at that? You know. But basically, we're giving God ammunition within us to fight against the devil. And Jesus had that at this time. Can you imagine Jesus being defenseless or, or being helpless? at this time that he's just about to start his public ministry, just about to start proclaiming the message in a new way, in a greater way that's gonna eventually lead to Jerusalem and the cross. But there he is. No, I don't live by bread alone. I live by what God says. No, I, I, I'm not gonna worship anybody else or serve anybody else, especially not you, devil. What a great opportunity that Jesus took and what a great opportunity that he used by having scripture memorized from Deuteronomy. Well, let's, let's look at our next part here. Uh, I'm not gonna take the time to read the 10 commandments. As I said, that's in Deuteronomy chapter five. But when I look at these commandments, I see places in the gospels that they are reaffirmed and talked about. Let's take a look at Matthew five, for example, 21 and 22. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And again, a lot of these passages are very familiar to us, but we want to make sure that we're seeing how God uses them in us. Matthew 5, 21, you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Wait a minute. So is this saying that if I call you a fool or an empty head, that's what Raka means, that that's as bad as walking up to you and shooting you with a gun? Yes. That's exactly what it says. Now, in a way, it doesn't have quite the same result. But in another way, it does. Even if I don't call you a fool, even if I don't call you an empty head, but I treat you like you're that way, or I, I, I don't want anything to do with you because I think you're a fool or an empty head, what am I doing? I'm withholding God's love for you through me, the love that God could give you through me. If you're outside of Christ and you need to hear about Jesus, but I think you're the the dumbest guy on the planet of the earth or the dumbest woman on the, on the face of the earth. I can't share God's love. I can't share the message of hope and of, of promise or salvation with you, can I? 
If I did it, it would be with sarcasm and condescension, most likely. When we lack sincerity, the message lacks sincerity as well. We would be hurting the person to talk about Jesus if we're going to do it that way. So, what's the solution? The solution is to love. And we'll get to that in a couple minutes. Probably heard a little bit about that in Sunday school today. Yeah? So, what, what is it about love? Uh, well, of course, we know that the opposite of love is... Thank you. No, but thank you. The opposite of love is apathy. The opposite of like is hate. Because you can love somebody, but you can hate some things about them. Maybe they have some addictions that are destroying their life and the life of your family. Uh, maybe they, they have some other practices or, or whatever in their lives, uh, ways of speaking or thinking or whatever, uh, that, that make life very difficult. It's important for us to love others the way the, the, that God loves us, the way the Lord loves us. I got to tell you that in my own life, there are some things that God must hate because I'm not fully surrendered to him the way that I need to be, the way I should be. And you may struggle with some of those things as well, or different things, most likely. I have no idea. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? That God knows us better than anyone else, and yet he loves us more than anyone else. And so... When I look at that neighbor, that, uh, that person I come across in the grocery store or, or on the highway or whatever, and I feel hatred for them or contempt for them or, or whatever, what kind of fool am I being since God loves me in spite of some things about me, many things about me, whatever. And I can't extend that to somebody else who hasn't hurt me nearly as much as what I've hurt God our holy and loving God. Now, I'm not saying that our attitude is going to turn around in an instant and all of a sudden we're going to love everybody because I've already said that there are a lot of things that we don't like about another person. And it might be somebody that we love very dearly. How do we deal with that? Well, when we treat somebody like they're an empty head or a fool, then we've lost out on the opportunity to influence them for the Lord. Let's take a look down at Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Somebody heard that and said, well, that's good advice. And I said, no, that's a wonderful commandment. It's a big difference. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body going to hell. Now, obviously I intentionally read that last part. Well, the first part. Adultery, like murder, isn't a specific act. And, and by the way, I don't think that Jesus is speaking only to men here. I, I think that for each one of us, that we have various lusts, many times sexual. And the way that we act on those, or the way that we even maintain them in our thoughts has an impact on the way we treat other people. In other words, I might never commit the physical act of adultery, but if, if I have a lustful heart, same thing is with murder. If I lust after a woman, I can't share Jesus with her. I can't love her with God's love while the rest of me wants to, to do, we'll, we'll call them unspeakable things with her because we won't speak of them. But when I love people with the love of God, 
then I can share his love in ways that this other person needs. And because we need to know that we're loved by God. And many times we need to know we're loved by God through other people. Now, as far as the gouging your eye out and cutting off your hand, I, I don't think that Jesus was literally saying this is what we had to do. I think Jesus used intentional exaggeration. Look at the part about, you know, your neighbor has a speck in their eye, but you've got a two by four in your own eye. I think Jesus went for some, I'll call them constructive laughs. Okay, when, when people laugh, sometimes they listen better. I wouldn't know I've never gotten a laugh in my life, but I try. That was supposed to be a little funny, but anyway. <laughs> The same thing with murder except talking about adultery. That I must keep my heart pure so that I can share God's love with others. So Jesus doesn't do away with the commandments. He strengthens them for us so that we better understand what is God's heart for us and God's heart for others. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 18. And no, we're not going to cover all Ten Commandments. Uh, a certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> Jesus' reaction is so interesting. It's one of the reasons I love watching The Chosen. Because the way they show Jesus interacting with other people is just phenomenal to me. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Boy, this had to set this guy back on his heels. You know, he thinks he's going to get in good with Jesus by complimenting him. If you remember in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus, he kind of does the same thing. Doesn't really address what he immediately says, but goes on to challenge him. He says, you know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. The young man says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Well, this guy was dodging. You know, Jesus is, is, is uh, you know, throwing puffs at him and the guy's dodging him. And then Jesus throws the iron ball at him. Catches him square in the middle of the forehead. Oh, wow, this is cool. You've, you've kept all these commandments. How wonderful. Glad that you were raised that way. Glad you've kept them. Oh, by the way, you're a rich guy. Why don't you just sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. By the way, that's not one of the Ten Commandments, but in Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 11, we see about taking care of the poor and about helping people around us. Matter of fact, there's another place in Deuteronomy where it talks about helping foreigners. <laughs> that ought to give us uh, pause because some of us get caught up in political games and sometimes we forget that needy people are needy people and we need to be part of the solution to that. I'm on record as saying that I don't think there's a political solution for a lot of things that wrong America. I think there are spiritual solutions, but not political ones. Well, that, that's for another time. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, in saying that I'm putting down both political parties, but that's, that's not where we're going. Let's go to Mark chapter 12, 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Mark 12 is an interesting chapter all the way through, of course. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Yes, it's in Mark 2. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The way that that the other gospel writers put this, especially Matthew. Some of the people who were there were trying to get Jesus into an argument. What's the greatest commandment? Well, if Jesus says this one, then they're going to argue that it's this one or this one or this one and accuse him of not liking these. Other. But I, I like the way Mark puts it. You know, this guy comes and he's like, yeah, cool. Jesus, you know, yeah. And when it talks about the most important commandment, love God, you know, let, let him be your only God, if you will. That, that's what he's saying. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And then love the Lord, your God, with all everything that you are. This comes straight out of Deuteronomy 6. Like I said, and, and next month sometime, we'll get back to that passage and look at it more in depth. But here's Jesus again. He's teaching. He's helping people to see more about what, what God wants in their lives. And if we change the direction of our lives so that God is first and foremost in our lives and the love for God shows in and through us, great things will happen. Uh, by the way, love your neighbor as yourself, I believe, comes out of Leviticus, not Deuteronomy, but that's okay. That's all right. Jesus basically sums up the Ten Commandments in the two and shows us how to live. Well, we're about out of time. I rarely say that unless I mean it. Um, let's take a look at a couple of these uh, in, in the uh, church. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 uses a quote directly out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25.4. Do not muzzle an ox while he is treading out the grain. <laughs> Do you know what that means? It, it means pay the preacher. That's all. Anyways... <laughs> Wow, not getting many laughs at all here. <laughs> by, by the way, in, in 1 Timothy 5, 18, it says pay the elders, but that's, yeah, we'll deal with that another time. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 31, 5 and 6. <clears throat> The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is coming down to the very end, uh, getting down toward the end of Deuteronomy. And Moses is saying as much to Joshua as, as he is to the rest. Don't be afraid of the people that you're going to be confronting. Don't be afraid of the people who live in these lands because God is going to be with you and he's going to help you. Be courageous. But that last part, God will never leave you nor forsake you, is quoted in the New Testament. And uh, I, I see that in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. Friends, there are promises like this that we must claim every day. We must acknowledge that God is with us as we go through this life wouldn't it be wonderful if, if life was always like a Christian service camp? Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was always like Sunday school or like church? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were always around people who loved us and cared about us and gave us everything that we needed? Life doesn't work that way, does it? But to know that God loves us 
never leaves us nor forsakes us, cares very deeply for us. Let's go to Deuteronomy 21. Right down toward the end of the chapter, 22 and 23. If someone is guilty of a, of a capital offense, is to, is to put, if someone guilty of a capital offense, offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury that body the same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Now, some of this you probably thought was kind of odd, but this is just strange. Except it isn't. Talking about capital punishment, executing someone for doing some of the things, breaking the laws that God has given them. And the meaning for that day was clearly, you know, once, once the person's dead, don't leave them hanging there forever. And I think some of the cultures, uh, other cultures would do that, letting wildlife desecrate the bodies and that would further motivate people not to do these evil things. But that phrase, anyone who is hung on a pole is cursed. We come over to the New Testament, to Galatians chapter 3, and realize that the word pole is the same word as for tree or for wood. Let's look at Galatians 3. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Paul's kind of setting a theme here. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is, based, is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the, the person who does these things will live by them. Now verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So, he says, look, if you're trying to earn your way into heaven by keeping the law, you're in trouble. Because nobody is perfect. Whoever breaks the law at one point is guilty of the whole law. And so if you commit yourself to doing that, you better do it all the way, but you're still going to fail. But instead of that curse, we had curse on us because of our sin, except Jesus took it away. Jesus died on the cross. In a conversation with some ladies yesterday, we were talking about how we really don't know the shape of the cross that Jesus died on. It might have been just a torture stake, as some describe it, where Jesus' hands would have been nailed like this. It could have looked like a big capital T, or like the small T as we usually think of it. <coughs> Peter apparently was crucified upside down. Andrew apparently was crucified on a cross that looked more like an X. It doesn't matter. The New Testament talks about Jesus being nailed to the wood, being nailed to the tree. And it talks about Jesus taking the curse away from us by the shedding of his blood, by his burial and by his resurrection so that we can have eternal life. The end of Galatians 3 speaks more about this faith so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Yes, faith is the primary response to what Jesus has done for us. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Interesting how Paul combines faith and baptism here in these verses at the end. 
In Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with him. We want Jesus. We want to belong to him. We want the blessings that only he can give because he takes away the curse of our own sin so we can have eternal life. Father, thank you. You've done everything for us. You've shown us, Father, the curse that we are under because of our sin, and you've shown us how that curse is removed through Jesus. May we come to him by faith. May we grow in that faith. May we serve you by faith in this world. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of your word. May we walk with you more closely every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.